Okay, I'm calling to order this meeting of the House Early Childhood Finance and Policy Division. And I'll start by asking the clerk to take the roll. Representative Pinto, Chair. Chair, uh, present. <laughs> <laughs> Representative Katiza Watoon, Vice Chair. Representative Franson. Representative Bonner. Present. Representative Damoth. Present. Representative Heinzman. Representative Morrison. Present. Representative uh, Pryor. Representative Wozolik. Present. Representative West. So we do have a quorum. Uh, I'll ask for a motion to approve the minutes of our February 27th meeting. So moved, Mr. Chair. Representative Bonner moves approval of the minutes. Uh, any discussion regarding those minutes? Hearing none, all in favor of approval of the February 27th minutes say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. We've approved our minutes. Um, so members, the first bill up is House File 3222. We had a discussion on this and testimony and everything. We really, this is last week, uh, the only reason we didn't act at the time was we just weren't sure where it was going to be sent. Um, and uh, we've determined it's going to be sent to the Jobs and Economic Development Finance Division. Uh, so any further discussion regarding that bill? We had a pretty extensive discussion last week. So hearing none, um, if I can have a, a motion to re-refer House File 3222 to the Jobs Economic Finance Division. So moved, Mr. Right. Chair. Thank you, Representative Bonner. Um, and so then, uh, all those in favor of the Bonner motion say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so House File 3222 is recommended for re-referral re to the Jobs and Economic Development Finance Division. And so with that, uh, Representative Wozlowick, you've got a couple bills up. Um, and as you head up, we're going to start with your House File 3173. And uh, we will have uh, Representative Wozlowick uh, move the House File 3173 be placed on the general register. Is that your motion, Representative Wozlowick? Yep. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move that House File 3173 be paste, placed on the general register. Okay. Excellent. So with that, Representative Wozlowick, please present your bill. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about, uh, not everyone is familiar with what a variance is, so just want to talk a little bit about what that means. Um, so a variance request is essentially um, a written request made by a licensed provider um, to be out of compliance with a specific part of the family child care rule. It's usually for a short period of time, and it could be something as simple as um, having an extra preschool aged child in their care for a limited amount of time. So that's, that's what, a, what a variance is, generally speaking. Um, and the bill we have before us um, is pretty simple and straightforward. It just requires county, um, counties to publish the policies and criteria for issuing variances on their website and um, update the information as necessary and then also to annually distribute that information to providers. Um, and I did a quick Google search yesterday and it looks like a lot of counties already post that information on their website, but we want to make sure that no matter where providers are in the state that they have access to that and that they, um, they know where to find that information. Representative Wozniak, can you just clarify for us, I think this is part of the work of the Family Child Care Task Force that you co-chair. Can you just kind of provide yep. some context, please? Yep, so this is um, a recommendation from the Family Child Care Task Force. Uh, we had a whole um, duty that was around uh, related to variances, and so this is one of the pieces that came out of that discussion. Okay, thank you. Um, I know we've got a couple people signed up to testify. Representative Wozniak, are you ready for testifiers at this point? Yep. Okay, so Representative, uh, Ms. Cunningham, if you can come on up. Um, and Ms. Leopold, you can as well. Um, and then once you get settled in, please identify yourself for the record, and then you can, you can proceed. Either, I guess, Ms. Cunningham, you're signed up first, unless, but if one of you would prefer to go first, but otherwise we'll have Ms. Cunningham go first. I will go ahead. Okay. <laughs> uh, my name is uh, Chair and Committee Members. Uh, my name is Cindy Cunningham. I'm a licensed child care provider in St. Paul for 24 years. I'm also the Public Policy Chair for McPin, uh, which is the 501c3 association in, Saint, in Minnesota. Um, our focus of public policy is to support and promote licensed family child care providers, ensure safety for children, and work to establish with established systems to ensure that licensed family child care is a viable choice for families in Minnesota. Uh, we're testifying in support of House File 3173 addressing the variances. This has been a part of our public policy um, agenda with McPen for a couple years because of the challenges and the discrepancies in all counties across the state. Um, to manage a licensed family child care takes many hats and many juggling and licensing and everything else. And one of the um, 
things I often share is I'm often the first person, um, hopefully after the spouse, to know that someone is pregnant and expecting uh, because the first question out of their mouth is, do you have room? Not congratulations. So a provider needs to know how to manage their business to know whether we have room or not. And in many counties, including Ramsey County, there is no transparency. There's no expectation given to us. There's no when, when can you apply for a variance? How do you provide for, excuse me, apply for a variance? And what criteria would need to be met? So this bill covers that, ensures that all providers have that clear, transparent communication. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cunningham. Before we move to Ms. Leopold, I know Representative Damoth had a, we'll have a question. Are you okay with waiting till the end, Representative Damoth, or, or is it a clarification? You want to ask it now? Um, we can wait till after. Okay, thank you. Then, Ms. Leopold, if you can identify yourself and then. Uh, My name proceed. is Kim Leopold, and I am a representative of the Association of Minnesota Family Child Care Licensors. And uh, we are also in support of House File 3173. The only, because I agree with everything that Ms. Cunningham said, there does need to be transparency. Um, if we're all kind of on the same page with it, then providers know when they can, if they can, what they can ask regarding a variance. The only piece that maybe is just a little language thing is that it talks about the county agency throughout the recommendation. And that is, there are some agencies that are not counties that, that uh, license family child care homes. So that might just be a, a language cleanup, but it shouldn't say just county agency. Okay, thank you, Ms. Leopold. Um, let me think, maybe uh, Representative Wozniak, anything you want to say just on that, on that last point about the, the county agency piece? Um, um, I think that's something that we can, we can do before it goes, when it's on its way to the general register, but that is a, I think one of the things that I can specifically remember is um, Sourcewell, I think, is yes. one of those examples um, that they're kind of, a, um, I think they have multiple counties that they, they work five with, counties. and they're technically not a county agency, so that would be an example of where we would want to maybe put some, some other language in there to make sure we're including those folks as well. All right, thank you. Anyone else in the audience who wishes to testify? Any member of the public? So seeing none, so then uh, we're gonna move to member questions. Representative Damoth. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, representative and test testifiers for bringing this forward. I know I have learned over the last year and a half more about variances than I ever thought possible. <laughs> so without a doubt, I realize the potential needs. So thank you for that. Um, I also serve on the Family Child Care Task Force. So maybe my question goes to you, Mr. Chair. Um, we have talked about that report, which you alluded to. Um, this is a recommendation that possibly has come out of that report. As a part of the Family Child Care Task Force, the report was due to the legislature March 1st, which was a Sunday, so um, we received, uh, uh, as a task force, we received kind of a tentative copy on Friday, and there were some concerns with that. Um, since then, we've also received notice that the consultant that was, was used to run the first part of the task force um, is no longer, has ended their contract. Couple different questions. First of all, um, the fact that this committee has not yet seen that task force, nor has the legislature, where are we at? And potentially, why are we hearing recommendations from a report that we haven't seen yet? And I, it can go, and I know, Representative, you're also a co-chair, and so maybe it's kind of directed at both. And, and so I'll, I'll say, um, uh, Representative Damas, so I don't have the report, I don't have a report myself uh, either, and, um, and so, you know, we'll, we'll get it when we get it, if there's something in particular that we can do in terms of being helpful with that. Um, as you know, there's the deadlines, and so as there are specific ideas coming out, it does seem like, sort of even separate from what the task force may have recommended, it does seem like this is a good idea just on its own anyway. Um, but yeah, I'm eager to get um, get the report when that comes out as well. Are there anything Representative Wozniak wants to add on that? Yeah, so um, Mr. Chair, thank you. Um, uh, originally, when we had scheduled our task force meetings, we were actually going to have our February meeting be the review of the of the draft interim report. And because we had got behind on the work, we ended up having February our February meeting be more of like finishing the interim report, and we didn't have a chance as a task force to see the final draft of that report. So there were some concerns expressed when it went out to the task force on Friday. Um, and uh, Senator Kiffmeyer and I were looped into that and just had a conversation around um, if there was a small tweak we could make to the language uh, to, to have it better meet um, what the task force had said they wanted to do. So we are working on that. Um, we're waiting on Senator Kiffmeyer to give her feedback and then hopefully from there we'll have the report done. And I may note, and can somebody remind me the, there's, it's, uh, 
Representative Wozniak and Senator Kiffmeyer, the co-chairs, Representative Damas on it, and then maybe there's a must be a Senate DFL member, Representative Wozniak. Senator Wickland. Senator Wickland, yeah. So I guess uh, Representative Damas, um, probably in the first instance, if this is just within the past few days, because it's now Thursday, I guess, and you're saying the report was due Sunday, so probably I'll just say as chair of this committee, I would in the first instance kind of defer to the legislators who are on the task force, and you know that if if you feel that you need some involvement or intervention that's necessary, please reach on out. But I'm probably first deferring to the co-chairs and to you, Representative Damoth and Senator Wickland, as kind of the, the first point of contact, I guess, if that makes any sense for the rest of the legislature when it comes to the work of that task force. And thank so, you, Chair. Damoth. Thank you, Chair. I had reached out, and I appreciate the response back. I had reached out as far as where that was at. There were minor tweaks from the beginning of February on the task force that needed to be taken care of, and then as it was released on Friday um, to the task force first, it um, ended up with a few more than just minor, minor tweaks. Um, so that, that's just kind of concerning. One other question, Chair, if I may. Yep, please. Um, with that contract with the consultant firm, um, is it possible for this committee to receive a copy of that contract? I don't know that I ever saw that, and I was surprised when that had actually ended. And Representative David, I will say I have very little knowledge of, of that regarding, I mean, I assume if it's a contract, it's going to be a public document, and so it should be something that we should be able to request, I would think. So why don't we, um, and let's, you know, let's make sure, you know, you should be able to, to contact the department if there's ways that, that, uh, that I can be helpful with that. I guess I can't think of a reason that that wouldn't be something to be available. But I can tell you, I, I don't have a copy. I've never seen that. I don't know, I don't know much about the, con about the consultant. I've really been deferring the task force on that. Okay. That makes sense. Thank you, Chair. Sure. Good. Any other member questions uh, or comments regarding this proposal? And hearing none, um, then I... Oh, I'm sorry. Representative Heitzman. <laughs> sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, here again, question for either the Chair or Representative Wozniak. Um, I'm a little confused, and I'm thinking you can straighten this out. So nobody has seen the recommendations of the task force. Is that correct? And Representative Heisman, I assume the members of the task force have seen at least a draft. I guess I'll let the co-chair. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, all of the task force members have seen the report, the recommendations. Yeah. And Representative Heisman, I, I have not because it hasn't been given to legislature. So Representative Heisman. I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. You had said that uh, two or three times, so I'm starting to wonder what uh, or who had seen what because right. I was confused okay. why you, you might not have seen it, but now, now it makes more sense. Uh, the uh, task force has developed some recommendations, so I'm assuming based on that pre-version that was seen by a number of the members that there were concerns, and I just want to clarify, was did the organization or group or whoever it was was hired to facilitate this and develop this report, did they just get it all wrong, or was it minor mistakes? What are we talking about? Representative Wozniak. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so essentially, I think the... Um, I went back and looked at the transcript from the meeting that we had, the February 4th task force meeting, and there was some conversation about, it was particularly about the tiered violation system. Um, so these, these couple of things in, in front of us were not issues that were raised from folks when they saw the, the interim report. Um, it was more around language around um, the tiered violation system and what exactly people wanted to do with that. Um, so kind of moving forward with that and in what, in what fashion. So that was what the, the concerns that we heard from task force members were around that issue and not around any of the things we're talking about today. Hold on, okay. Any other questions or comments? And so Representative Damoth. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Representative Wozniak, um, I believe one of the testifiers, and I'm not sure which one, maybe just mentioned that some of the wording, a little bit of the language did need to be cleaned up here. Um, my question, and then maybe also you, Mr. Chair, is if we're sending this, this to the floor, can we clean that language up here before it heads to the floor? Um, Rep, uh, Representative Damoth, let me just see what ability we have to, I'm, I, I'm pretty sure that, that, that our, our uh, amendment um, deadline can be waived, although, although it does feel like maybe this is something we'd want to be able to take just a breath to um, to address. So I see Ms. Fraser coming up from the Department of Human Services, so there may, may be something that she can say to be helpful to us here. So please Ms. identify yourself Thank for the you. record. Mr. Chair and members, Beth Fraser from the Department of Human Services. And while there is um, a governmental entity that um, does licensing on behalf of some of the counties, Sourcewell is actually a governmental entity, the term used throughout the statute is county agency. So that is the term. 
and I don't think it necessarily needs to change. And if it changed in these few places, then it would be um, incongruous with other places in the statute. So um, there may be reasons to recodify the statute at some point and clean things up and make them more clear, but this is not necessarily a change that we think needs to be made. And Ms. Fraser, maybe I can just clarify then. So that phrase, county agency, is 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 inclusive in the way it's used in the rest of the statutes inclusive of the broad set of agencies or organizations entities that are that are doing this this work as described yes, yes mr okay. chair thank you Representative Damoth, anything further? Um, yeah, one please, question yeah. Yeah. Um, mr. chair thank you would it be possible to lay it over and correct this with an amendment well, well Representative Damoth, it doesn't sounds like there's no need for an amendment though because so the so the term the term is already inclusive of what of what you want to accomplish. So it sounds okay. like there's no need for an amendment. All right. Thank yeah. you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Okay. Anything further? Questions or comments? And so hearing none, uh, uh, Representative Wozlowick uh, renews her motion that uh, I should probably ask any closing thoughts, Representative Wozlowick. Should have given you the chance. Okay. Um, and so with that, Representative Wozlowick renews her motion that House File 3173 be placed on the general register. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the motion prevails. House file 3173 is recommended for placement on the general register. So Representative Wozlowick, then to House file 3822. <coughs> and you can begin presenting that bill whenever you are ready. Oh, actually, I guess we need to get that in front of us. So would you like to move your bill? And this is to be recommended for re referral to the Judiciary, Finance, and Civil Law Division. Yes, Mr. Chair, I move that House file 3822 be re referred to Judi Judiciary, Finance, and Civil Law Division. Okay, thank you. And with that, please uh, present your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I talked a little bit about what variances are um, when I talked about the first bill here, and I just want to clarify kind of the purpose and intent of what we're doing with 3822. Um, we've discovered in, in our conversations around variances that um, some counties grant variances and other counties uh, do not for a variety of reasons. And one of the things that we've heard mentioned by um, counties as to why they're not granting variances is they had concerns with language around liability, which is what we're attempting to address um, with this bill today. Um, our intent is to make counties feel comfortable um, granting variances to family child care providers. And um, this was also a recommendation that was made by the Family Child Care Task Force um, to try and try and change that language so that we are giving counties um, what they need to be able to feel comfortable granting these variances. Um, I know that there have been some concerns ra raised around the language, um, but it's it's a we're trying to find a solution to this problem, and this is one one um, way that we thought we could do this. So I can talk a little bit about what the bill does. There's a couple pieces. Um, so one of the pieces of the bill, it directs the counties to use a uniform application uh, form for variances. And um, right now, uh, quick look at the forms. They're all pretty different and different lengths and require different things. So we're trying to get some uniformity for fa um, family child care providers across the state by requiring that this form, that the, at least the initial application form, looks similar. Um, and that is something that the Family Child Care Task Force itself would work on this form. Um, the bill also, this is the liability piece that I mentioned, uh, modifies liability. Um, and our, our goal with this is to try and take the, li the personal liability off of licensors so that they don't feel like they can't do um, variances as part of their job. So I will leave it at that and uh, open it up for testifiers. And, and Representative Wozlick, had you, um uh, in, in reviewing the bill just now, I guess did you reference that section three as well? There's both. I guess that is the application form. Okay. Yeah. All right. So those are those two pieces. Yeah. Why don't we move to testifiers, then we can kind of get into the the meat of things. So um, if we can have um, Ms. Cunningham, and Ms. Leopold, head on back on up. We have a few testifiers on this bill who've signed up. And I guess we can go in the same order then, perhaps. So Ms. Cunningham. Yes. Um, <laughs> please, uh, uh, please proceed. Thank you. Uh, my name is Cindy Cunningham, uh, same litany of uh, provider and McPen. We are testifying in support of House File 3822, again, for transparency. One of the discussions we also had in this whole process is with 87 counties, it was almost impossible to figure out which counties did, which counties didn't. Um, and so as an over, overreaching view, uh, that we could not really obtain one. So a uniform application would at least potentially give the state some ability to keep track of when there are variances and when there aren't, rather than having a disjointed system. Um, the liability um, was, is a bit complicated. The intent of the task force 
And um, I wasn't involved, obviously, in writing the bill. The intent of the task force is to have the county licensors be in the same standard as the state licensors. Um, so in the state licensors, and I'm not a lawyer, but the liability if a, if a licensor grants a variance at the state level, um, it's the entity, it's the state that is under the liability. In the county, the way the wording is and has been evaluated is that the actual licensor would obtain that liability, and therefore then that complicates um, complicates the granting of variances. So, okay, thank you, Ms. Leopold. Please, Kim Leopold, Association of Minnesota Family Child Care Licensors. We are also in support of three eight two two regarding a uniform. Um, application form, and I know that on the task force we can do that, and part of AMFCCL has been gathering the um, variance forms from throughout the state, and we're hoping to develop one and, and maybe bring that to the to the task force, and then we can all talk about it. And, um, and then, again, speaking from a person who is personally liable, and the, and the language is really bad, we found out yesterday in the, in the Senate. Um, so I... We are obviously in support of removing personal liability, and as Ms. Cunningham said, we state licensors are hired by the Department of Human Services, and they are not personally liable, but we are. We could be sued personally, not just covered by the counties that we work in. And I know that in my county, that is part of the reason that we do not grant especially capacity variances. All of that being said, even if we do have a uniform um, application and the personal liability gets removed, that doesn't mean that variances will automatic, automatically be granted. There are things, every house is different, every provider is different, every situation is different. So we're in support of it, but we realize that there's some things, I guess, that need to be fixed legally that I don't understand either. <laughs> and I'll maybe note, before we move on to other, other testifiers, just for members, members of the committee, members of the public, that um, the uh, liability and legal issues will be addressed most specifically in the Judiciary, Judiciary Committee. This is where this bill is headed next. Our focus, of course, is on the early childhood portions. I think it's good for us to be, for those issues to be raised. Um, but just to, to remind members that, uh, that this will get a, a thorough review from the judiciary and civil law perspective in that committee, and our focus is on the, on the child care piece of it. So um, uh, so thank you. And so we'll bring up um, Sarah Coe and Chuck Slane. Um, or uh, it looks like Mr. Carlson will be going up in uh, Mr. Slane's. Oh. And is, so Sarah Coe had signed up. But maybe not. Okay. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. And Good morning. Members. Yeah, please identify yourself for the record, um, Mr. Carlson, and uh, if you're the one who's going to be going, and uh, and proceed. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and members. Joel Carlson. I have a legal research and government affairs business here in St. Paul, and I'm here on behalf of the Minnesota Association for Justice. As most of you can tell, I'm not Sarah Coe, <laughs> uh, who was unable to get here uh, through traffic. And so um, uh, I was going to uh, give some brief testimony to this bill anyway. So uh, if Sarah does arrive, maybe we can indulge her, but I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, so uh, Mr. Chair and members, this is my first excursion into this particular committee. I'm usually over in taxes and bonding and state government finance at the eight o'clock hour, but I appreciate all of the hard work that you do and our association has followed the child care issues very closely uh, over many years. Um, and our hope and, and what we encourage is that you develop um, rules and a variance process so that the child care industry can grow and thrive, but also that we do it in a way that's protective of children. Um, we do that because our members have the task of representing families uh, who have seen their children abused, injured, sexually assaulted, and killed in family daycare settings. And there have been dozens of these over the years, so, as has been well documented. Uh, that was Sarah Coe's reason for coming here, it was ha happened to a family member for her. We want to focus just on section two, and the reason that I want to do that here, and I appreciate that this will go to judiciary and and uh, and we don't resist that. It's a, this is a well-intended effort, but I want you to think about the policy in section two of this bill. Um, and it's a, it's a provision I have personal experience with. It passed in 1986, all those many years ago when I actually was a member of the House, a member of the committee that wrote this bill, and I know why it's here. 
when we made the decision as a state to allow counties to do childcare licensing and not the state, we did so deliberately, but we also want to address this issue of liability for the municipality when they know, and if you look at the language, when they know they have actual knowledge of a licensing standard that's not being met that resulted in a dangerous condition that harmed a child. If they have actual knowledge of that, they need to act. That's not a discretionary decision. You have to do something. That's the way the law has been unchanged since 1986, and we think that that is a good thing. I can tell you that the language in front of you is um, uh, maybe misguided or not quite artfully drafted, but we think this actually puts the liability right on the license insp uh, inspector in a way that you don't intend, and that it's our feeling that uh, they are not personally liable now, and some education and information about what really is happening, we're not aware of any situation uh, where, uh, where a licensing inspector has been found personally responsible for a decision that they made. If those cases are out there, we want to know about them, but we're personally unaware. Uh, so the way it's written right now, it's an absolute immunity uh, for everyone when they, act, when they have actual knowledge. That's the language that we're striking. They have actual knowledge of a dangerous condition, and that just goes too far for us. Um, I think Mr. Slane is going to address a couple points on the bill. Mr. Chairman, then we're happy to answer questions. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Carlson. Um, I, I just want to make sure just to pause on one point that you made, though, because I know that previous testifiers had great concern about having personal liability. You're saying, so in your view, under current law, there is no, the personal liability they're concerned about doesn't, does not, is not present. If you can just, just clarify that and then we'll move Mr. to Mr. Slane. Mr. Chairman, um, uh, we always can be enlightened, but if you look at Chapter 466 that you're amending right here and the general rule of law, every municipality is responsible for the torts of their officers, agents, and employees. The municipality has the liability. That never extends down to the peace officer that's making a decision on the street or a license <laughs> inspector. We're just not seeing it that way. Um, I agree that with 87 counties, there can be confusion on application of how the law might actually work, but we just don't think the law operates that way. Okay, thank you. And Mr. Slane, please identify yourself for the record and then proceed. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is Charles Slane. I'm a lawyer with TSR Injury Law, and I'm here on behalf of Minnesota Association of Justice and not uh, opposing this bill. Um, I wanted to give you a little bit of guidance on the current scheme that is set up for liability of licensors, and it's under Chapter 466. And to be clear, what this does is we're regulating people whose job is to protect our children, the most vulnerable people in our society. And it creates a minimum amount of accountability for the folks who do that job. The bar is already set very high for liability. Municipalities who do licensing can only be responsible if there is evidence of actual knowledge of a dangerous condition that is foreseeably going to cause injury to a child. It's very hard to prove that, and cases against licensing authorities are very rare. And frankly, one of the reasons they're so rare is they do a good job. Um, but what we're doing now with this change is we're flipping that completely, where we're taking away the ability for some minimum amount of accountability and, and creating absolute immunity for the municipality. So no matter what, they could not ever have accountability. So what that would mean is that if a daycare provider is properly licensed and then a relative who's a convicted sex offender moves into the home and the licensing authority knows of this and allows it to happen and then one of the children is molested, that licensing authority could not be held accountable for having that happen. But this bill goes further and changes the situation in terms of now the actual person doing the licensing work, the employee, could be the one held accountable. This bill actually changes it so that rather than the municipality, it's the employee that could be held responsible. That's complete opposite of the current regulating scheme under 466, and frankly, just a bad idea. 
Um, and more importantly, it's in, we're missing a big opportunity here to provide the protection to the municipalities that they desire. Because the only time that people like me representing injured victims look at uh, a municipality who did the licensing is when the daycare provider doesn't have insurance. And right now, the state, when they license providers, do not require that daycare providers carry insurance. If I were to open a taco stand in downtown Minneapolis, I'd have to purchase a million dollars in liability insurance. But if a daycare provider wants to be licensed to take care of our children, they're not required to have insurance at all. That is the way that we provide the protection to the municipalities that they really seek here when they create variances, is have the providers be insured. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Slane. Um, so any other testimony from uh, members of the public at all? We've got oh, Ms. Leopold looks like wants to come back up. So let's, uh, if we can have her, which I think makes, makes sense. All right. Thank you, Mr. Slane. <coughs> so Ms. Leopold, please uh, provide some further comments based on what you've heard. AMFCCL. I think the issue with, with the variances is that by granting a variance, we are knowingly allowing providers to not follow the law. So something could dangerous could happen. So th that it doesn't happen all the time, but by saying it's okay for you to have four infants instead of only three, we, we are saying you can vary this part of the law. So that's where it, how it falls on us because we are knowingly signing something that says they're not gonna follow the law as it's written. Mr. And Ms. Yeah, Ms. Uh, Mr. Carlson. Well, Mr. Chairman, and, and we can drill down on this further, but you know, whether it's an environmental permit or a daycare permit, um, it, uh, a conditional use permit, if I have a variance within my permit that allows me to do something, that is my permit. That is my license. I'm licensed to do that. To suggest that a variance um, somehow creates, um, you know, an elevated liability doesn't make sense in the permitting world because I have the approval to do that. We, you're not going to license something that is dangerous, I'm hoping. Right, you're gonna license something that you know is going to be safe in that circumstance. And when I, that, that variance becomes part of my license. So when you're looking at a licensing standard, if I'm supposed to have five and I get a variance to have seven, that becomes my licensing standard for seven. And so I'm not quite tracking that a variance that is attached to that license somehow elevates their liability. and. You know, when you look at this language, the only way you get to the licensing agent now with this language is if they're found guilty of a crime. So there's no negligence involved here at all with this language. They have to be on line 2.29. They have to be found guilty of an undefined term, malfeasance, willful neglect of duty, or bad faith. I don't know what those particular crimes are. But they actually have to be found guilty in court. This puts the target right on the licensing agent in a way that I think is, is a step in the wrong direction. So I think we're, um, we may be getting a little bit into the judiciary and civil law issues, it seems to me, in terms of the, the, uh, the various issues that have been raised. So I'm glad to get them, get them elevated for us. Um, and I think, uh, as was referenced, I think by Ms. Leopold earlier, I know that there's, um, there probably be, need to be some ongoing discussions about those judiciary and civil law issues. Um, but I'll ask first, is anybody else who wants to testify? We'll first, first say that, so uh, nobody there. And then member questions, looks like uh, Representative Bonner has one, and then Representative Heisman does as well, Representative Bonner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, uh, Representative Waslewick. Um, I, I, obviously I have some concerns about that language and the back and forth, but obviously I know uh, I am not a prosecutor nor an attorney, and I assume that the Judiciary Committee will do a more thorough vetting of that language, so I will set that aside for now and focus on the parts that apply to this committee. Um, if I'm reading the language correctly, um, really there's only a couple parts that actually apply to our committee. Um, lines 2.14 through 2.15, and then um, it looks like um, 2.30 through 3.3. 3. 
And in those, it, basically, it's pretty straightforward, laying out a timeline for this process, indicating that by September 1st, the, um, the uh, Family Child Care Task Force will create a uniform form um, and supply that to the commissioner. Um, and that as of October 1st, the commissioner can go ahead and issue that form. And it becomes effective January 2021. And it also says that there is some training to be done, which basically, if I'm reading this correctly, gives a three-month window for that training. And my only question is this. Will, it be, uh, will three months be sufficient? Um, or is there any concern around that three-month window um, to get this up and running? Representative Wasaway. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Representative Bonner. I haven't heard any concerns with that timeline, um, but certainly if, if concerns are raised, we can look at making that a longer time period if we need to do that. All right. Thank you. Representative Bonner. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Wasaway. Thank you for that. I appreciate that uh, feedback. The, and, and just as a, a note here, I do actually appreciate um, on the first bill, of course, we talked a, a little bit about transparency. Thank you for that. Um, and of course, this follows that same pattern in having some consistency and efficiency. And as someone who, who looks at process controls for a, a living, I, I certainly appreciate that also from the ability for providers um, and municipalities to follow the same path. Um, I think that will definitely be a great addition. So thank you for that. Representative Heitzman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. On lines 3.2 and 3.3, there's a uh, discussion around this form. And uh, I'm, I'm glad the representative just a moment ago mentioned this because I think that there's some questions here we need to address. I got two questions, actually. The bill requires DHS to use a form developed by the Family Child Care Task Force and this task force includes four members, two of whom are co-chairs from the legislative branch. Is there any concern regarding the separation of powers in legislative matters, drafting forms outside of the legislative process uh, that are required to be used by a state agency? And if you want DHS to use a specifically made form, Shouldn't you put that form in statute, Representative Wasley? Representative Wasley. Um, so I don't know that it needs to be in statute. I think that's part of the work of the task force is to do this. If, if we end up developing a form and it seems like it's more appropriate for statute, we can do that. But we don't have a form to even work with to talk about being in statute at this point. Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, if legislators are writing uh, this recommendation, and then drafting the form, though, Representative, isn't that the same as essentially the legislator or legislature at that level then coming and uh, asking that we provide this kind of a, this kind of a, I don't know, there, it just seems very cozy, the relationship there. And I'm wondering if we're going to have legislators making the recommendation, why aren't we just putting it in statute? Representative Wasley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm Representative Heinzman. This is a 25-member task force, and the vast majority of members on there are not legislators. And for the most part, at least from my perspective as a legislator, I stay out of, I, I might vote on something that is developed, but for my, my part, I'm not the expert in the room. So I'm relying on the other members of the task force who are providers and parents and licensors to really come up with what they think are the best recommendations, and in this case, what they think would work for a form. I'm not a variance expert. Um, I've seen variance forms, but I would rely on folks like the licensors and the child care providers to, to develop, to come up with those ideas, and then simply be there to support those ideas. Representative Heisman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Could you explain that a little bit better? At least, and maybe it has been covered and I just didn't catch it, but why was this an important task that the group decided we needed to address as the legislature. Representative Wasilek. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Heinzman. Um, so there's issues around, um, I think Representative Bonner alluded to this and others, um, around transparency and that counties um, have a wide variety of um, processes for variances and, and, and also the form that they use. And there are guidelines um, in, in our, I'm not sure if it's rule or statute, but that talk about like how 
how you can grant a variance and what and sort of the criteria you need to meet to, to get a variance um, in terms of what um, county agencies have to have to consider when they're doing that. So we're trying to get some consistency in terms of a process and a form um, for folks to use so that we're not having 87 counties doing things 87 different ways. Um, we have providers that move from county to county and all of a sudden the process is very different, the form is very different, or um, they can't find that information. So we're trying to develop something that's a little more consistent and something that's going to be um, widely used and widely available for folks to see. Yeah, Representative Heisman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And maybe the testifier can answer this. Um, are we getting, and part of what I'm concerned about, I'm driving at here, and you probably can see it coming, is are we getting in the way of counties able to address local issues by saying, okay, here's the form? Mm. Uh, Ms. Leopold. Kim Leopold, Association of Minnesota Family Child Care Licensors. Um, no, by and that's what I said earlier in my earlier testimony. By developing the form doesn't mean that we ha that we are all going to be uniform. There's also been talk on the task force of having DHS take over the variances and strongly across the board with providers and licensors that that's not the way it goes because we have personal relationships with the providers in our areas. The, also the reason for the variance discussion in general, it was one of the 10 tasks, I'm on the task force as well. One of the 10 tasks is um, the shortage of childcare in the state of Minnesota and by getting some transparency, getting a very clear idea of offering variances for capacity might help open up some spots in family child care homes across the state. I know that I, I, I would assume that we, we, I mean, we still will have, you know, I work in Dakota County, that's very different than Beltrami County and the variance needs and the child care needs there. So I think by developing the form, we're all gonna be doing looking at the same guidelines, but obviously, like I said, every situation, every uh, child care, every home, every provider is different. So I, as, a, as a licensing worker, I, I don't feel that. And I don't feel that from the other members on the AMFCCL board or my coworkers or other licensing workers that I talk to. We, we still feel like we would have a say in working directly with our individual providers. Representative Heisman. Hold on. Maybe, maybe I'll just follow up on Reverend Simon's had some questions. This is maybe somewhat for him, I suppose, in part. <laughs> um, I'm just wondering, would it, would, it, um, uh, would it make sense to have the commissioner develop the form in consultation with the task force? Because I guess I do wonder a little bit, to have 20, a 25-person group agree on a form by September 1st, you can imagine maybe that. So I just wonder. There are okay. members of the Department of Ms. Human Leopold. Services on there, and I think the yeah. concern with that with providers, and I don't know if Ms. Cunningham wants to speak to that more than me, um, is that that there are some things that DHS overreaches on, and they want to and they want the task force to have that um, that opportunity instead. And like I said, I know that on AMFCCL board, we can gather everyone's variance form from the entire state, and we will develop one and bring it. And if we don't like it, we'll do what we've done with everything else on the task force and beat it to death until we do. <laughs> Okay, so uh, we'll bring in another member of the task force, Representative Damoth, on these various Thank topics. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, well said. <laughs> very well said. <laughs> From living it, very well said. <laughs> um, a couple of questions, um, Representative Walsowick. Um, just kind of thinking through and now actually finally getting to see the legislation that's been drafted, because I know we didn't get a chance to see that before. Um, if our task force is expiring on February 1st, what authority or prevention on either side of that would there be if it's if the language of the um, of the uh, uniform application if, if that's not already in statute um, how or what authority would DHF DHS have to revise that form after we expire Representative thank you mr. chair I don't know that I can answer that question on behalf of DHS because I am, am not clear on what what their role would be in this going forward um, but I do think that um, as I said, we don't even have a form developed, so if we right. develop a form and say that we, we actually want to put this in statute, that is something that can happen. We certainly can't do that now. We don't have a form. Right. Um, but I think that is a piece of the discussion. If we want to we wanna do that, we can certainly do that. But I think for purposes of trying to get task force work done before, that, before we expire, I think that's an important piece of at least having an idea of what a form would look like. Representative Thank Damoth. Thank you. And uh, yeah. one more question, Mr. Chair. Has there been a fiscal note requested because there could potentially be some um, implications for the agency under Section 3? We'll go I'll direct that to Mr. Berg. 
Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Damoth, there's not a fiscal note on this because at this point the task force develops the form and gives it to DHS to use, so there's no action by the agency other than to accept the form and distribute it to the counties as the form. So, no. Okay, thank <laughs> you. Representative Damoth. Thank you. And Mr. Chair, um, on line um, 3.1, knowing that there's possibly necessary training and guidance for the counties, that would be a question that I, I would have potentially. Do we need to have that? Um, Representative Damoth, you're asking whether there's a cost associated with that? Yeah. And I guess I'm gathering from Mr. Berg that the department has said and that the assessment is that, that no, there's no cost associated with the bill, including that sentence. Okay. That's what I'm being advised. All right. Thanks, Mr. Chair. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Katiza Wittoon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative Boswick and Representative Damoth, thank you for the work that you've both done on the task force. I think that um, this is something really good that has come out of the, the work that you've done with child care providers all across the state. And I think that when we, when we hear directly from our child care providers, uniformity and consistency and efficiency is, are, are all things that we want out of our government oversight. And I think that um, when we when we can streamline processes like this, it, it does impact the day-to-day -day business of these providers. I think this is um, a really good step in the right direction, and I just appreciate you bringing it forward. Yeah, thank you. And, and I echo those things. When I was being asked before about the receiving the reports or the various things, I was delighted not to have any direct connection until the, until the task force comes with a final. So I'm really grateful to you, to all of you. I believe Ms. Cunningham's on the task force as well, I believe, yeah. Um, and so um, really impressive group. Um, any further questions or discussions regarding 3822? Um, oh, Ms. Cunningham, you had something that you wanted to add. We'll allow you to do so. Thank you, Ms. Cunningham, um, Cindy Cunningham. Um, I just as a comment, like I said, uh, McPen has had this. Um, we've been working on trying to figure out what is the solution. We actually were the first ones that kind of poked the bear to say, well, then if the liability can't be handled by the counties in a consistent manner, let's put it back to the state because everything else about our, um, our license is ultimately managed by the state. I concur that it's better handled at the county, but nothing was being addressed, nothing was being handled. We were getting 87 different answers. And again, I speak from personal experience where I've put in for a variance three times in Ramsey County. Can't get an answer, can't get anything done. Had a 14-year-old, was maybe gonna be at my house, or not a 14-year-old, I was gonna have a schoolager who was maybe gonna be at my house for 45 minutes, three times a week, depending on if somebody didn't get um, picked up. And that child um, ended up, I wasn't able to keep them. They were um, put out into nowhere. Um, that's the county's decision. I'm not arguing necessarily about, about that, but it took a month and a half of digging and trying, and I'm rather persistent, as you probably all know, um, but it took a lot of effort just to get the county to come forward with the information. These efforts would help m ensure that providers are given that information. The decision making would stay with the counties. As far as the form, that would be for someone else to decide. Um, I think the task force has the expertise to be able to help do the form if it's done be, um, with the commissioner with the recommendation of DHS or however that wording needs to be. Thank, thank you, Ms. Cunningham. Thank Representative you. Wazowick, you're going to add something. Yeah, Mr. Chair, if I can, we, as, as was mentioned, we do have members, uh, folks from DHS on the task force, and they provide input and answer questions about their role and, and things they think do or do not work as we move along. So whether or not we put that in the bill, there is their input is part of the process. Okay, thank you. So members, um, so clearly there are <clears throat> issues that have been raised regarding Section 2 liability issues that will be addressed in the, in the Judiciary Committee, and I know Representative Wozlowick uh, will work with, with folks on that. I just want to encourage um, especially those who testified about the personal liability concerns to speak with um, uh, speak with our other testifiers about that because I mean that seems like something that we should be able to clarify and have an understanding as to what at least what the the state of the current law is regardless of what um, we might be urging the law be changed to so but again those will be addressed in the next committee in any case um, Representative Wozniak any final comments thank you Mr. Chair um, thanks members for a good discussion and um, as as I mentioned we're going to be working on this language. Um, Senator Kiffmeyer is carrying the bill in the Senate, and we've already had discussions about what she's doing and, and, and her work on the language, so we're going to connect on that and hopefully have some sort of solution to this issue. Um, we, we really do, as a child care task force, really do want to do what we can to make it easier for family child care providers to provide that information, that transparency and the uniformity, um, and making sure that 
counties are able to grant those variances. So that's that's our goal here, and I think there's some work to do, but we feel I feel confident that we can try and figure this out and, and find some language that's going to work for, for us as we move to the judiciary. Thank you. And with that, uh, Representative Wazalik renews her motion that House File 3822 be re-referred to the Judiciary, Finance, and Civil Law Division. All in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. And with that, uh, House File 3822 is on its way to Judiciary, Finance, and Civil Law Division. Uh, Representative Wozniak, then, your third bill of the day is House File 3884. Um, and uh, Representative Wozniak, would you like to uh, move that your bill be placed on the General Register? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move that House File 3884 be placed on the General Register. All right, thank you. So with that, please present your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so House File 3884, um, simplifies, simplifies the child care assistance program disaster response procedure, um, and it also uh, provides a statute update for the child care services grant. Um, and I, that's the general overview of it. It's not a super complicated um, piece of legislation, but I can open it up for anyone who has testimony or questions. Okay, thank you. I do know there's uh, Ms. Cunningham is going to be testifying, so we'll have her come on back up. We'll have you, uh, as you settle in, just renew your identification of yourself and then, uh, and then proceed with your testimony. Thank you. Cindy Cunningham, child care provider, McPen Public Policy. Um, they let me out of the house, so I just have to keep coming up to the table. Sorry. Glad to have you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and specifically, um, I was able to be on a group of stakeholders and dealing with the service grants and some of the discussions around the uh, process on this bill. Specifically, we want to uh, support uh, line 3.9 to 11 uh, regarding the change from uh, reimbursement for mileage and efforts uh, for people who are reviewing uh, the process to a stipend. We no longer do much of anything by driving on these kinds of work. It's done electronically, so this would actually reward and support the people who are doing the review of these service grants. Okay, thank you. Anyone else uh, who wishes to testify on House File 3884 from the public? Not seeing anybody come up. Uh, with that, member questions or comments? Anyone? Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Wozniak, is it fair to say that this bill could be described as expanding the authority of the commissioner to retroactively waive child care program requirements from the date of a disaster? Representative Wozniak. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I don't know if expand is the correct word. I think um, the conversation that I had with um, folks from DHS is that the process right now can take a long time and be very complex. Um, and so the, the goal is to try and make this process work better. I don't know if expand is the right word. I don't know if anyone wants and, to elaborate yeah. on that from DHS, but I don't, I don't know that it's expanding necessarily. And, and, and we can, if either Representative Heinzman, you can go ask another question, or we could have somebody from the department come up and help with that. That's okay. All right. So let's have um, Ms. Bosin come up. And so once you settle in, if you can identify yourself for the record and then provide Certainly. information for us. Good morning. My name is Lori Posey, and I'm the manager of the Child Care Assistance Program at Department of Human Services. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, Representative Heinzman, this, this particular section of authority sits in, um, it's really requirements for families that are waived, um, family activities. So, um, and in current law, um, we have the authority to waive those activity requirements. That's the most common waiver that would occur um, if there was a you know, tornado in southern Minnesota, um, a county could elect to ask for a waiver to uh, basically uh, allow more flexibility um, to allow the child, um, the family to continue to use child care. And so um, the current authority just says that we have to wait through several processes, um, which just doesn't make sense in the, in the time of a disaster. So um, we wanted to shrink the process um, so that, the, the, that it was clear that the waiver could begin um, really as soon as it's been identified as a disaster. Representative Heisman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Could you expand on what we're now going to be waiving in the event of a disaster? I think everybody agrees that when you have a crisis, you need to move fast. But what was the obstacle that we're trying to overcome? Because as I'm reading this and I'm looking at line 2.20, that we're going to be giving the commissioner 
you know, some fairly significant uh, expansions in authority, um, expanding the list of eligible programs uh, and uses of the grant. So what was an obstacle to responding to a disaster previous? What are we trying to fix? And what, what were some of the criteria that were holding us up? Ms. Bosin. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, Mr. Chair and Representative, um, 2.20, that section, 2.10 to 2.20, that has to do with the grant program. And I apologize, I was speaking to um, the disaster waivers in 1.119B26, so lines 5.4 to 5.12. A couple different things, I think. Representative Heisman. I was looking in the bill quickly, trying to find where the commissioner's powers are expanded, and you're correct. I made a mistake. I'm looking in the wrong place. But could you still answer my question as it relates? <laughs> and Ms. Posting, maybe you can provide some specific, I was wondering about that too, some specific examples of the kind of hurdles that a family would encounter that this allows. Uh, we've got maybe, um, well, Ms. Posting, <laughs> you can answer, or if uh, your colleague, if Ms. Summerfield, wants to come up, but if you can Certainly. take a stab at it. Um, Thank you. Mr. Chair and Representatives, um, do you mean, I just want to clarify, do you mean the family disaster language? I, I think Representative uh, Heisman's talking about on page five, the authority to waive requirements. Is that bad? We should clarify that. If it's, Representative Heisman, please, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, yeah. I, yeah, I'm specifically referring to, you, you had mentioned that there needed to be an expedited process for the commissioner to react if there's a disaster because the current process doesn't work. So I'm wondering, well, what was in the current process that wasn't working? Ms. Bosin. OK, yes. Um, chair and rep members, um, the, um, the, the retro, we did not have the retroactive statement. So by adding the retroactive statement, um, because what happened was we would get a request, and this has only happened twice in the last 10 years. I've, I've been overseeing the programs. Um, but um, we would get a request from a county. Um, so, for example, one county asked to waive activity requirements that the family didn't have to be at work to use their child care assistance. Um, and so, um, but they, you know, the families would go, were part of a cleanup effort in their, in their community. Um, and so we had to, we had to approve the request and then we had to send it to um, to the Ways and Means Committee, um, and and before the effective date of the waiver is what's being stricken, and so that meant that we really couldn't grant it until those things had happened. Right. If I can just, and clarify, so Ms. Bosin, like so, an example you said activity. So if a family is required to be working in order to use childcare assistance, but there's you know there's a flood and they can't get to work, and it's you know for that couple days. That's an example of a requirement that, that maybe would be waived in this, Ms. Bosin? Mr. Chair, correct. Okay. Representative Heinzman. One yeah. last follow-up. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Sure. Chair. So I think I would like to go back to the bill, and I have a line 3.31. Could you help me understand what other uses could be as approved by the commissioner? Can, and, 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 can, can you pull your microphone just close to your mouth? We couldn't, couldn't hear. What, what was the line that you were, that you were pointing her to? 3.31, Mr. 3 Chair. 3.31, okay. Good. And Ms. Bosini, did you see This is under the Child Care Services Grants. Child Care Services Subdivision Grants. Subdivision 5, yeah. Okay. Um, Mr. Chair, I'm going to defer to Jennifer Sommerfeld right. because that sits in another area. I, I manage child care assistance, and that sits in our other area of our department. And please identify yourself and then proceed. Great. Thank you. Uh, Jennifer Sommerfeld, Department of Human Services. Um, Mr. Chair, Representative Heinzman, that is actually existing language. Um, if you look... Over on page, well, I have to try to find it, which I'm not going to be able to. Um, we right now have that authority. We crossed out, if you look starting on page four, all of the language that relates to family child care providers. Um, and we did that because we're combining family and centers so that in these grant programs, we're treating them the same. Um, so we canceled out those statutes and made sure we combined things in over here. And it's my understanding this one is existing language. Can I, uh, Representative Heisman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, could you show me where that existing language is? Yeah, I'm not I might it. not be able to while I'm sitting up here. But the, what we, oh, 4.13, thank you. Somebody who's able to look while I'm four, speaking. 4.13. <clears throat> 4. Oh, yes, thank you. So is this, Ms. Summerfeld, so is, is this basically 
you know, much of page three, much of page four, essentially uh, a technical, yes. more of a, a streamlining as opposed to making a substantive change? Correct. What this bill does, I mean, there's a substantive change to this portion of the bill, and that is that right now family child care providers don't, they're not eligible to receive as much in grants as child care centers are. So family child care centers are capped at $1,000. Child care centers are administratively capped at $2,500. Uh, it makes sense to us to have the same level, especially with the child care shortage, to ensure that family child care providers can um, receive funding in the same way. There, um, and then we align the requirements. Right now, child care centers have to have a 25% match. We're eliminating that and simply setting one set of rules, one set of availability for funds for family and child care centers. That's helpful. Representative Heinzman, anything else? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I'm going to go back to line 2.20. Other yeah. programs as determined by the commissioner. Is that existing language as well? That Ms. is Simmerfeld. existing language, and I'll have to go back over to page 4 to find where that is. Other uses. Sorry, my expert testimony testifier was not here today. She might be text IMing me, though, so I'll keep watching. Um, that is existing language. I'll just have to look for it and find you. I'm going to talk to you about that offline. It's, and so, Ms. Sommerfeld, is, so basically the, stream, the changes that you're talking about where it's mostly streamlining but then providing, uh, uh, matching the level of grants for family care as for center-based, et cetera, that seems like that extends pages, mm -hmm. I guess, one, one, two, three, and four, essentially. Like, those are all... I want to make sure we're understanding yes, that the change on page correct. two are part of that. Okay. Um, Representative Heinzman, anything else from you? Okay. Other questions or comments from members at all? Not seeing any. Um, okay. And I think I had asked for any other testifiers from the audience, I believe. So, uh, Representative Wozlowick, any final comments on House File 3884? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I think one of the things that we've talked about a lot today <laughs> is trying to be um, simplify and transparent and uniformity. And I think this helps us make things uh, easier for families to access child care assistance when they need it and uh, in terms of the <coughs> child care services grant to make that uh, more understandable and more uniform between family child care and centers. All right, good. Thank you so much. So with that, Representative Wozlowick uh, renews her motion that House File 3884 be recommended for placement on the general register. Uh, all in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. House File 3884 is on its way to the general register. And with that, uh, our final bill of the morning, Representative Pryor. And just verifying our, uh, it is 3737. Uh, and as you head up, um, <coughs> Representative Pryor will be moving House File 3737 for placement on the general register. That is your motion, Representative Pryor. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. That is my motion. Excellent. And I do believe that you have uh, an amendment. Um, so uh, I do. The A1 amendment. So uh, we'll have you uh, uh, move the A1 amendment to put the bill in the shape that you wish. Yes. You, uh, that is your motion? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All that right. is my motion. Any discussion on the A1? Hearing none, all in favor of the A1 motion to put the bill in the shape the author intends. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. So then, uh, Representative Pryor, please present House File 3737 as amended. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Um, this, uh, this bill, what we're trying to do here is um, falls under that uh, category of federal compliance and conformity. Mm -hmm. So um, we, we do have... Um, a block grant that's a federal block grant and to administer here at the state level we need to be consistent with the language and different requirements and so we're just trying to clean things up and um, continue with our uh, federal conformity and I do have a testifier that can um, walk us through the bill and explain in detail. That's great. Um, Ms. Fraser please introduce yourself and then proceed. Thank you Mr. Chair and members. Beth Fraser with the Department of Human Services. As Representative Pryor said, this bill does include the remaining elements of federal compliance related to training requirements. It also includes a number of provisions that we have, we are suggesting, we are supporting after being in conversation with um, family child care providers. The 
Um, issues related to training stem from the federal law, which requires that everyone that federal law um, considers a caregiver has to have training. And so federal law defines caregiver as somebody, as an individual who provides child care services directly to an eligible child on a person-to-person -person basis. And so there's been some, some discussion about, well, it doesn't say a substitute has to have this training. And we've said, well, but if they're not providing child care services, then what is their role? I mean, and that is what the federal government has said to us. If they, you know, if, if they meet this definition, regardless of what the state calls them, they are required to have training. So when we first began discussions with child care, family child care providers about this requirement, the initial concern was, what if there's an emergency? What if I have a heart attack and, you know, I need somebody to stay with the children while I'm being, you know, taken away in the ambulance? And so last year, in response to that, there was a bill and we provided technical assistance so that in a true emergency situation like that, where the child care provider for unforeseen circumstances needs to close their business for the day and is going to have somebody stay with the children until the parents can arrive, um, that person does not, is not required to have training or a background study because we do not believe they meet this definition of caregiver because they are just there to make sure nothing bad happens until the parents get there. But if they are spending more time and are scheduled, then we believe, and the federal government has told us, they meet the definition of caregiver and need to have training. And that requires a number of changes to our current training requirements. So most of the gaps in state law relate to people who provide substitute care. So somebody who is providing care instead of the provider. Um, we currently have a few different of um, requirements for substitutes depending on how much time they provide care. And so currently there are some substitutes who only have to have first state or only have to have um, sudden unexpected infant death prevention training and abusive head trauma training. And that is the training required if you provide less than 30 hours of care a year. If you provide between 30 hours of care and 30 days of care, you're also required to have um, first aid and CPR. And then currently, if you provide more than 30 days of care, you have to have all of the same training that the provider has to have, which includes health and safety trainings and child development trainings. So this, in order to come into compliance with federal law, would require substitutes to have all of the federally mandated training. In order to make that as easy as possible, because we understand that this is an increase for those substitutes, the department has developed a shorter class to cover all of the federal health and safety training topics in one four-hour class that also covers child development because those are the, kind of the new requirements. So it could all be done in one fell swoop in one four-hour class. Um, there are a few other gaps that this bill addresses. Um, there's some instances where you could have a second adult on site, and as long as the first adult has CPR or first aid, the second adult wouldn't need it. That does not comply with the federal law. And Ms. Fraser, I might ask you to wrap up in the next minute or two if you can. I just want to make sure yes. that we can Sorry. go to questions. Sure. Yes. Um, so this addresses those federal changes. Um, and federal requirements. It also, in addition, does a long list of things that we have um, discussed with providers and heard from providers that they want. One <coughs> is it broadens the definition of substitute so that if somebody has all of those federally required trainings, somebody could use one of those people, which is still a lower standard than what the providers have to have. They would have all the federally required trainings, but not everything a provider has to have. They could meet that standard and provide up to 500 hours of care annually, which matches another change that was made last year. Um, it broadens time that a family member can spend with the provider's child, um, or it broadens who can spend 
time so that it's somebody related to the child, not necessarily to the caregiver. I'm happy to walk through everything. I don't. I, I'm also happy to just I, answer. I'm kind of thinking, why don't we? Why don't we be driven sure. by by questions? Yeah, yeah sorry. Which is, no, which is just which is just fine. Yeah, we can be driven, driven by questions. Let's, if we can, though, I'm thinking, why don't we? Will uh, I know Ms. Cunningham, Ms. Leopold have wanted to testify um, as well, and so why don't we do that? Um, and then, but then Ms. Fraser will, will probably have you come back sure. for uh, for questions too. Um, we'll make sure to give you four stamps on your frequent testifier card, so you can. Thank you. <laughs> So next time we'll be free or 10% discount or something. Mr. So, um, Chair. So uh, please, uh, um, uh, Ms. Cunningham, uh, just confirm your, your identity and proceed. Uh, Mr. Chair and committee members, Cindy Cunningham, Family Child Care Provider and McPinn Public Policy. Um, the substitute um, training, uh, for most providers, these substitutes are 30 minutes here and there. They are often family members. I actually have found someone who is working as a contracted um, substitute, so I can be here more often, thank you. Um, but on all of these things, it's so that we can balance our lives. It's so that we can step away, so that we can be a part of what most providers stayed, started these businesses for, was to be more engaged with our families. And yet, then we get restricted to the 7 to 5.30 or whatever the hours are, and we cannot remove ourselves from that setting unless we close. And then we are really caught between parents needing to work and the squish becomes as far as the frustration. Do we charge, do we not charge? And then how do parents handle us when handle their own children when they're closed? So it's a very complicated um, setting and pressure on our part. Uh, we do understand that this is a part of the federal block grant. Um, the part that I want to just share at this point is that there is a lot of frustration about the amount of change and I will say, um, attack might be a little extreme, but we've gone since um, 2013 with the union, with, with um, the safe sleep, universal pre-K, and now all of the changes here. So I would say the response for family child care providers are, are that we're wary of change. So um, the things, in, I have been in discussions with DHS and in Bennett meetings, and um, I really uh, appreciate that there is a shortened course um, what we need to continue to, so I'm not used to talking to people all day like this, <laughs> but we need to continue um, to receive is things like a year implementation so that providers have time to reevaluate their businesses, implement their businesses, and have people to be fully trained uh, to be able to do this. And also the communication, even though DHS has done um, a significantly increased ability or, or presentation of communication. In January, I was at a county uh, training that I was giving, and the providers had not received the implementation plan from last fall. I heard from a provider this morning. They just, many people just got the information about the training changes for last year. That's the county delegated struggle that we're under. So to then put this on again, that's the part that really, really needs to be honed um, and, and continue to be increased with it. Uh, so the technical assistance is a critical piece to allow us to catch up. Uh, we do have some concerns with the CPR first aid being removed from the CPR first aid experts standards. Um, we, at least for the first time, you, I could go three years with having only um, have, having had my CPR first aid and in between my training um, instead of the two year that's recommended. Um, we would at least like to uh, make sure and ask DHS to ensure that providers are aware that they are out of compliance with CPR and first aid standards. Um, there are some refresher courses that are available, and if a provider thinks, well, I don't have to get trained on that two-year time period, and then they reapproach their trainer, they would then have to take a longer course um, on that part. So um, they at least recognize the 30-day also. As far as CARs, um, we would like to see that uh, providers are not allowed to transport if their CARS training is not up to speed. I'm a car seat technician. Um, the adding of the KCFs is critical in statute to be able to assist providers and counties to implement that correctly. Good. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm Ms. Leopold. Uh, Kim Leopold, Association of Minnesota Family Child Care Licensors. I'm kind of going to go a little bit differently piece by piece, starting with the supervision of a family child care license holder's own child. 
Um, as licensors, we understand the spirit behind the bill. What this means is that anyone who's, who is related to the child can come into the family child care home business and remove that child, the provider's own child from the daycare area and take them into another area of the home. We understand that this was grandparents visiting, aunts and uncles, things like that. I have had a provider ask me if her 12-year-old daughter can take her infant daughter into another area of the home, and I have to say yes right now. So we are in the business of supporting providers, obviously, but also keeping children safe, and I don't know um, how we can word that better, that, it, that it's because they're not required to take any of the training, so they're not held accountable, so anyone who's caring for those children could put an infant in a safe, safe, unsafe sleep space, um, and I just it, that that's risky to me and and concerning. Again, I understand the um, the spirit behind the bill, but sometimes the spirit isn't always what the providers see and realize. So that's a concern from AMFCCL regarding that. And then I have a question. Just a question: Is it any number? Is the substitute any number of hours? Um, like if they are doing any number of hours that training? Well, we can, um, okay. you know, we usually do it differently, but that's okay, we can have you, but let's, oh, but let's get a clarification. I'll, I'll keep moving. Okay, all right. Um, and then there, there, is, there is some pieces in here regarding um, uh, providers being allowed to, so to Ms. Cunningham's point, CPR first aid has to be taken every two years. That is what, um, American Heart Association, American Red Cross, those places require. You are out of compliance with those organizations if you don't take it every two years. In this draft, it is allowing providers to not take that training um, at the expiration of it, but allowing it to go until their license expires, and that could be a really long time. And I know the reason, because I've been in contact with Ms. Fraser as well, I know the reason is to maybe more align with centers. The difference between centers and family child care is that in centers, there are other people present with first aid and CPR. When you're the only caregiver, it, it could lapse six months. First aid and CPR could lapse six months or more if it doesn't fall where your license falls. And again, to protect the health and safety of children, that, that is also concerning. Um, so that's first aid and CPR. And as Ms. Cunningham testified to, the CARS training, that's the car seat training. Again, that is through usually like AAA or the Minnesota or the Public Safety Department. Um, that expires after five years. And again, they'll let that lapse until their license goes and we have a concern. Um, with that. The only other, th the other thing is ensuring, there's a lot of language in here about ensuring training of people, and we would prefer that if it says, do that it says document, ensure, we do have providers that lie about their training. Um, ensuring means what? That they write it down. It doesn't mean that there's a documentation of it, and I just would like to continue to see the documentation of it so we can see that providers and substitutes have um, taken the training. Um, the other thing that's in here that's too big, I, I get it. Um, there is a section under um, subdivision 7E that talks about um, where providers can take training through, and the way I read it, and I could be wrong, is that they can only take it through the develop tool, which is where most providers get their training, but there are other options available, and that is um, college courses, college training in other states. I know in my county we offer training a few times. Yes? No, um, yeah, if you could just wrap up, um, please. We, and, and I might just, just pause for a second um, just to, to understand the, because I, I believe this is, we need to do at least significant components of this for for federal compliance so we don't avoid a significant federal correct, penalty. But yeah. The items Mr. I'm speaking Chair. to are not for that. Yeah. Mr. Chair. Mr. Representative Heitzman, yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt. I'm just looking at the clock like you are, and we have about six minutes yes. remaining. Would it make, I didn't hear the motion. What are we doing with the bill? So the plan is for it to go to general register, but what I'm thinking, Representative Heitzman, is let's just see how far we get here. Um, and I'm, uh, so yeah, I'm, you can tell, I'm not, yeah, I'm not extending folks beyond. So, so well, Representative Heitzman, yeah. You've been really generous with the time. We've had a lot of bills to discuss and we've had a lot of questions. 
um, would you consider laying it over so we could talk more about it? Because there's so, a lot. So, Reverend Heisman, so here's the thing. I definitely will, but, uh, but let's spend the next five minutes, and then if we hit 9.30, and there'll be a very, I think there'll be a good argument at that point, but I just, rather than take time discussing whether or not we do it in five minutes, let's just take the time to do whatever we can now. So, um, so Ms. Leopold, if you could please wrap up um, uh, with anything, if you got any final points there. Um, That's okay. So, okay, thanks. So, Ms. F uh, and Ms. Fraser, we'll see if anybody else has anything, but can you just remind us, Ms. Fraser, what portion of this is required by federal compliance and, and what portions are not? M M Mr. Chair and members, the, um, the changes related to increasing training requirements are related to federal compliance, but another piece that we're doing here at um, request of providers is rearranging the statutes and putting all of the training into lists of here's exactly what you need to take when. And so it's not easy to pull out necessarily, it's not just this one section, it is sprinkled throughout the whole bill. So it is not easy to point to exactly which section does what. I would, if, if I may very quickly, I would say that the, in terms of the CPR first aid and CARS training, there was a proposal last legislative session from a different group of family child care providers asking that they get additional time to take trainings like this. We thought, well, that's reasonable, and so we have included it into our proposal. And so part of, so there are obviously difference of opinion among providers and licensors, but that's where that came from. And there is still a requirement that you document all of the training on page 15. So we are not erasing that. Thank you. So here's what I'm going to do is let's first of all see if there's any, and so please, uh, our testifiers, please stay close by. First to see if there's anyone else in the audience who wants to testify on the bill. Let's just make sure we, we get that addressed. I'm not seeing anybody come up. Um, and so what, what I'm inclined to do is we'll spend the next few minutes, uh, we've still got another five minutes, to, to chat through things, see where things stand. I guess I will just confirm for all that some, that significant portions here we know have got to become law this year or we are out of federal compliance. I guess we maybe we already are out of federal compliance with these points and potentially get a significant penalty. Um, so just as we're, it's kind of as we're, as we're sorting this through. But one of we'll have a series of questions go from there. So Reverend Heinzman, you're, you're up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My first question is for Ms. Fraser. When you started your testimony oh, earlier on the other side of the desk, you made a statement that kind of popped off a little bit of a question mark in my mind. What did you mean, and I think I got it pretty close. We are suggesting, we are supporting, after talking with child care providers, and then you went on to describe what the bill does. What does that mean? Ms. Fraser. Um, Mr. Chair and Representative Heinzman, what it means is that the pieces in the bill that are in addition to federal compliance come from stakeholder engagement, from conversations with providers and others about things that they would like to see changed. Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So are you supporting those changes or not that came out of the discussions with providers? Ms. Fraser. Mr. Chair and Representative, we are supporting them. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, to the bill author, uh, Representative Pryor, I know that a lot of the discussion over the last year and a half has been centered around reducing regu regulatory burden for providers. Um, that's been an ongoing piece of the conversation, no question about it. So I know we've heard a couple of different concerns that the testifiers brought relative to uh, provisions in the bill. I'm hoping you have a list of things that this bill does, which it's lengthy, so I'm assuming there's got to be something specific you can point to or a list of things would be even better that are driving towards trying to get at that issue for providers, the regulatory burden that they're facing. And uh, I think the quote that I heard out of some of uh, the testifiers was that the, the regulatory requirements have taken the joy out of what brought them to providing care in the first place. Mm -hmm. So, Representative Pryor. So I appreciate uh, the question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Heinzman. And um, so this bill actually, you know, we've been working on it all last year as well as this year. And I sat down with um, a number of uh, different providers and representatives of those groups and working also with, um, you know, the folks in DHS, uh, um, Ms. Leopold also, just to keep hashing through these things and get that right balance between um, you know, we do have this underpinning of federal uh, requirements that we have to do and that we can't fudge on. 
um, and it is regulatory, um, but it's, it comes from um, the federal. But then there's other things, and I think this is this lengthy list <laughs> that, um, that is in the bill, and what it is trying to do is, um, well, first of all, make it easier to comprehend and more transparency by pulling things together and talking about training in one place. Um, and that is, you know, at, at the request of, of the providers to not only is it the amount of regulation, but your capacity to understand the regulations. And so that's something that this bill is trying to do. So to your point, you know, I, I, um, that, that is where we're heading. And, um, you know, we could follow up in a, and it obviously is something that would take a lengthy conversation to go through point by point how, how this impacts a, a particular a, a provider. But we could do that, um, you know, offline and really get into the nitty gritty of it. And then, so these are the discussions that I've had in the past. And, um, um, you know, maybe, and I, if, I, if I may, um, I'll turn it over to Ms. Fraser just maybe to give a couple examples. Let's have Ms. Possible? Fraser, please. M yeah. Mr. Chair and Representative Heinzman, I just want to point out that the concerns that were expressed this morning were about that DHS, that the proposal goes too far and would allow providers too much time to take training. Just to be clear, the concerns were you're going too far. So... I, I just want, you know, there are some providers that said, we want until our expiration date to take training. And the testimony this morning was, whoa, we're worried that's too much time. We're worried that puts children at risk. And so just to clarify what, what was heard this morning. Representative Heisman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this is, the, te the testimony is kind of helped me out. I guess I would argue, make my point. And I hope that if this bill does move out of this committee today and we don't have a chance to really get a hard drill down into the issue that I'm concerned about, and that's a regulatory burden and a list of things, maybe on the House floor, we could provide members a better opportunity, this is to obviously the bill author, to know exactly what we're doing driving at that issue. Because if I've heard anything from providers and from parents, it's been the regulatory burden is, is really, really difficult. Uh, to Ms. Fraser, I think that you had mentioned something relative to our compliance in federal law and the bill out there also represent prior, but the changes that we're specifically making in this bill, are they required for federal compliance or is that something we're doing here in Minnesota for other reasons? Ms. I think we sort of got an answer to that before, but Representative Pryor. Right, um, and so this is what we were addressing before and, and particularly that section um, that was described in detail about uh, what's called a substitute, but is actually um, in the federal uh, requirement calls that person a caregiver. And that, that's, that, that's not something, I mean, that is the, the that's why we're, the, the, this is the part that we need to be in compliance on. Mr. Chair. Representative Heisman, yeah, we're almost done, and so we, we'll let you go, and then Mr. I'll. Mr. Chair, the we'll reason I'm there. asking is yeah. because there are cases, and I'm sure you're, you're, you see them, where we interpret federal rules a certain way and agencies try to implement those things. Uh, I'd like, if there's a way, Mr. Chair, to know, is this an interpretation of what those federal rules and those requirements are? Is this something that, as, that, that is, is something we can, that, that is in stone, or is this is the way we view it? And so I don't know if that question has been answered yet. That's why I asked again. Sure, and I, the impression I got was that there's not a claim that everything in this is required by federal law. Some of these things are required by federal law as, as I think as a sort of fair interpretation. Um, but as long as those are happening, then there's other steps trying to respond to concerns from family and child care. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and I wanna point out that of course we do some of that in some other bills as, as well. So, so here's what I'm inclined to do. So um, Representative Pryor, I'm, I'm, I'm inclined because it is gonna be going to the general register. Um, to lay the bill over at this point. I know there's several folks who also have questions as well, and certainly there's some specific points um, made. And so I would expect we'd get back to it pretty soon. Um, so even uh, next week, we've now had public testimony, et cetera. Um, and so uh, what I'd ask, especially for our two testifiers, Ms. Cunningham, Ms. Leopold, to connect with you and with the department, because what I, I guess what I, um, well, I'll just say, some version of the bill needs to become law in order to meet federal compliance. At least there's some components there. Um, so as there are specific areas that were identified in the testimony, please encourage them and anybody else to work with Representative Pryor um, to address specific concerns and specific sections of the bill. Um, but uh, with that, uh, and so then members will get back to the rest of the discussion. I know we've got a couple members as well. I suspect Representative Heisman may have some other pieces, and we'll do that when we bring the bill back up. Um, 
Does that make sense to you, Representative Pryor? Okay, good. I'm seeing a nod there. So with that, uh, I'm uh, uh, laying over House File 3737 as amended. Um, and then just uh, members, a couple things about the next few days. Tomorrow there is a symposium on the opportunity gap and on education. I really encourage members to attend. I think um, there's a pretty action-packed and exciting day, including an amazing speaker on early childhood issues. I want to highlight that. And then next week, um, reminder on Tuesday, but on th for our 8 a.m. meeting, on Thursday it is likely we'll be starting somewhat late um, because of uh, 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 some other conflicts. And so we'll send notice out about that. We'll be starting at like 8.30, but we'll send a note out, of course, um, well in advance. So with that, we are adjourned. Members, thank you so much. Thank you.